Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much for coming to the Society for Preservation of Natural History Collections, affectionately known as Spinach, uh, and the Biodiversity Crisis uh, Response Committee panel discussion. We're excited to bring together today a panel of experts. We have with us Tara Cornelesi, Rob Grop, Jeremy Kerr, Rebecca Johnson, and Henry McGee to discuss the ways that the natural history collections community can work together as individuals, as members of institutions, and as a professional community to more deeply address the biodiversity crisis. First, some details and housekeeping. We'll begin with introductions of the committee members, and I will then provide some background about this committee, and or we will then provide some background about this committee and some of the work that we've done so far. Then we're going to have um, introductory presentations from each of the panelists. From there, panelists will discuss questions that were posed ahead of time, and then from there we will open it up to questions from the audience that we've uh, received from the chat box. We also have started a Google Doc to record participant names and to provide a place for additional discussion. So check it out. We'll continue to put it in the chat um, throughout the time here. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Spinach YouTube channel after we've uh, worked it out. All right, well, let's jump in then. Um, first, some introductions from the committee members. So I'll ask that uh, maybe they could turn on their video for a quick second uh, for a, 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 a two sentence introduction, and then we can uh, go into the next round of things. So I'm Libby Elwood, I'm chair of the committee. I'm global communications manager for iDigBio, and I'm also a researcher at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I'm an ecologist um, interested in climate change and conservation, and I regularly use speci specimens in my research. So that's what brings me here. And um, so let's see, through the committee, let's start with Andy, if you're available. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Bentley. I'm the Ichthyology Collection Manager at the University of Kansas Biodiversity Institute. Um, I look after our 680,000 specimen ichthyology collection. Um, I am also involved in the Biodiversity Collections Network, or BCON, um, and was also one of the committee members who just recently wrote the National Academy of Sciences Biological Collections Report. Thanks, Andy. Um, Yuta. Yeah, hello. My name is Jutta Buschbaum. I'm an evolutionary biologist and working freelance. My interest is in transferring advanced statistical genetic approaches into reliable conservation genomic tools. Um, I know by experience how important it is um, to have um, secured and well-managed voucher specimens um, for, um, well, early on in the chain of custody for monitoring, certification, and forensic genetics. All right, Talia. Um, hi, I'm Talia Kareem. I'm the Invertebrate Paleontology Collection Manager at University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and I'm also a co-author on the National Academy's Biological Re Collections Report that Andy just mentioned. Um, and I'm interested in how museum collections data get used by various end user groups um, and in some of these big reports um, that are going out about conservation. Austin, if you're available. Hi, I'm Austin Mast. I'm a professor in the Department of Biological Science at Florida State University. I serve as director of FSU's Robert K. Godfrey Herbarium, and I serve as director of IDIC Bio's Digitization, Workforce Development, and Citizen Science Domain. Thank you. And Gil. Yeah, it looks like you might be muted. I'm the director of IDIG Bio. Very delighted, to, very delighted to be here. In my previous life, I was a conservation biologist, a conservation botanist, working in natural areas for various government agencies and private entities, and have a very, very big interest in using collections in biodiversity research, uh, as that's what I did before joining IDIG Bio. Great. And Eric is going to round up our uh, introduction of our committee, and then we'll jump into a presentation uh, with some more information about the committee. Good morning, everybody. My name is Erica Wheeler. I'm the head of uh, Collections, Care, and Conservation at the Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria, Canada. 
I also represent the Alliance of Natural History Museums of Canada um, at Spinach. So um, my interests are in um, all aspects of natural history collections at this point, although my, my training is as a, uh, a botanist and a systematist. Um, really, really interested and happy to have everybody here um, to see how we can move things forward on making uh, a real impact in the world using biological collections towards conservation. And Libby, should I um, go ahead from here with the presentation to talk about? Great. Yeah, jump right in. So Andy, if you'll please go ahead and share my, share my presentation. Great. So for those of you who aren't familiar with spinach, let me, this slide just gives um, a brief introduction. So the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections is an international organization devoted to the preservation, conservation, and management of natural history collections. In a rapidly changing world, natural history collections are rich storehouses of information for understanding the past and predicting the future of life on Earth. Our members and their colleagues identify, catalog, document, prepare, preserve, conserve, research, develop, and share. They educate and they advocate for natural history collections around the world. Next slide, please, Andy. Great, that's the one. In May 2019, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services released a report that highlights an escalating crisis in biodiversity loss around the world. Across many major groups of life, from bony fishes at the top of this figure to cycads at the bottom, a substantial portion of assessed species are threatened with extinction, and overall trends are deteriorating, with extinction rates increasing sharply over the past century. Key messages from this report are, number one, that nature and its vital contributions to people, which together embody biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services, are deteriorating worldwide. Two, direct and indirect drivers of change have accelerated during the past 50 years. Three, goals for conserving and sustainably using nature and achieving sustainability cannot be met by current trajectories and goals for 2030 and beyond may only be achieved through transformative changes across economic, social, political, and technological factors. Finally, the good news, nature can be conserved, restored, and sustainably, and used sustainably while other goal, global societal goals are simultaneously met through urgent and concerted efforts while fostering transformative change. Next slide, please, Andy. The Biological Collections Community heard this call and the Spinach Biodiversity Crisis Response Committee was convened soon after this report was released. You've just met the committee. We are here to serve the Biological Collections Community in matters pertaining to the biodiversity crisis and to develop in consultation with you actions we can take that will have the most impact. We're interested in hearing for you, from you and if you would like to contribute to the work of this committee. Please follow the link posted in the chat to leave your name and contact information if you'd like to follow up. Next slide, please, Andy. <clears throat> the committee is charged with exploring ideas and implementing actions that spinach and the natural history collections community at large can take in reversing these trends. Our first job is to listen to the community about how to focus our efforts. In March 2020, we posted a survey across many museum, university, university collections, and research listservs. We asked respondents to rank the relevance and importance of 10 potential actions that the collections community can take to respond to the biodiversity crisis. We heard from 301 respondents. 55% of those were spinach members. We had fairly good geographic representation. Um, although it was heavily weighted towards North America, 75% North America, 15% Europe, and the rest from Europe, uh, sorry, from the South Pacific, South America, Africa, and Asia. There was um, sector representation from universities and museums especially, but also from government agencies. 
So um, these four actions that you're seeing on this slide were considered by a majority of the respondents as relevant and important. So these are the, these are the actions that we're taking very seriously as we go forward with our mandate um, um, as a committee and are interested in hearing more from you. So these are to develop initiatives to ensure critical data is available to conservation practitioners, advocate for legislative and policy change to support biodiversity conservation, develop outreach programs to raise public awareness and encourage personal action, and to participate in international conservation bodies such as the IUCN. Next slide, please, Andy. So what comes next? Um, we're in the phase of listening to the community and um, understanding what our um, what is broadly considered to be the best actions. Um, now, uh, today, we're really excited to have you here um, as part of the, to listen to the panel discussion and explore ideas about how to move things forward. In the winter, we're planning to consider these conversations, and so please look for other invitations to join us, uh, and that will be to consider particular actions. By the summer of 2021, we hope to be in a strategic planning phase to actually um, start to implement some of these decisions. So I'll stop and leave it there. That's a brief summary of how we came to be and um, looking forward to hearing more from everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Erica, and thanks to all the committee members for all the work that you guys have been putting into this over the last several uh, weeks and months, so much appreciated. And now we're going to segue into our next um, round of introductions, this time from the panelists, and several of the panelists have presentations to share as well. So we will um, hear from each of them. And as you are listening to their presentations, I encourage you to think about questions for our um, for the next segments of the webinar here. We're going to get started with Tara Cornelesi. And when you're ready, Tara, take it away. There we go. Can you see, can you see the slideshow okay? It looks like we're looking at your... Um, oh, yes. you are. Okay. <laughs> That's strange. All right. Well, can you see it here? Yep. This looks really well. Right. Let's keep it here just, just for sake of time and ooh, that's a little too much. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank um, the uh, spinach committee <laughs> for the invitation and also putting together this great panel. So um, my name is Tara Cornelisi and I am a senior scientist um, with the Endangered Species Program at the Center for Biological Diversity, which is a um, national nonprofit um, working to conserve biological diversity. Um, so I also am an insect conservation biologist. So I'm a conservation biologist that focuses um, on insects. And um, let me move this up here. Let me hang on. It's not working. I'm just going to give a little bit more video. There we go. Um, I grew up in Michigan. Um, I fell in love with insects on the dunes and shore of Lake Michigan. Um, and then from there, I went on to study them in ecology and conservation at Boston University to receive my undergraduate degree. And then after that, I went to San Francisco State to um, obtain my master's degree. And it was there that I started working on tiger beetles. Um, and I also, when I was at San Francisco State, worked in the entomological collections, uh, and that was sort of my first start, I guess you could say, kind of in the, the collections world, and then also using them to determine my um, study species, because I was really interested in rare um, insects. After I started working on tiger beetles in San Francisco, I sort of became a tiger beetle person in the Bay Area. And so I decided to go down to UC Santa Cruz to do my um, dissertation, my PhD. And there I worked on the Ohlone tiger beetle, which this is a picture of that, that guy there. So beautiful. Um, I continue to work on that species. This is a picture of me here right before the lockdown of the pandemic where I was um, uh, working to do a translocation project of the Ohlone tiger beetle. 
from my uh, dissertation, I went on to the American Museum of Natural History, and this is where I did my postdoctoral work. And um, while I wasn't working in the collections per se, I was working at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation. And my role was more of um, a scientific education postdoctoral scholar. And I was able to work on using the museum collections and using the, the, what the museum had to offer to create undergraduate education modules. So I started also connecting museum work to higher education and conservation. Uh, from there, I became an assistant professor at Canisius College, where I taught conservation biology um, and animal behavior. Um, but after a few years of that, I was, I was really itching to do more direct conservation, kind of get back to working on um, endangered species, working on the connection of science and policy. So I then decided to kind of uproot that, do the leaving academic thing, academia thing and go to work for the Center for Biological Diversity, um, where I'm now a senior scientist. So I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit more about um, the work that I do and how it intersects with collections. So um, basically the work that I do at the center is centered around the Endangered Species Act. And so one of our great conservation laws here in the United States and it's extremely important um, for protection of biodiversity here. So because I um, focus on insects uh, is, probably most of you know, <laughs> and um, Erica's slide showed earlier that insects are often like very data deficient. So it can be very difficult to try to get them to be listed under the Endangered Species Act because you do need very specific information from historical ranges to current ranges. You need to sort of prove that a species has declined in a substantial portion of its range. Um, in addition, once hopefully you get a species protected under the Endangered Species Act, that's sort of when the real work begins. Um, you know, the Endangered Species Act has what they call consultations, um, efforts to try to mitigate any negative uh, activities that could impact listed species, as well as the, you know, the effort to try to recover those listed species. And again, collections are extremely important to those areas as well, to see where species are, to see where they can survive, where their habitat uh, was provided in the past and potentially where it is now currently. Um, and then finally, also, I get to sometimes work on new policy, which is very exciting. And um, I'll give an example of one that I worked on that does include monitoring um, for, in this case, native bees. So I'm just going to give a couple examples of each one of these areas where I work on um, the intersection of collections and endangered species. So this is the Mojave poppy bee, this cute little bee here on the right. And it is a bee that I petitioned to list. And it's a great example of a native bee where we actually have fairly good information because um, bee biologists have studied it in the last few years. Uh, but still, as you can see from the map on the left, this is its known range. And the historic sites are in gray and the current sites are in yellow. And those are you know, the, what, the only things that we actually know about. So this is a, a specialist on bear poppies and it's thought to be only now in those yellow seven locations in Clark County in Las Vegas, Nevada, for those of you not in the United States, sorry, I don't have a larger map <laughs> as part of this. Um, from the collections information, we know that it's highly likely to be extinct from Utah. It also appears to be gone from California. However, that is from collections of general insects in the areas that it used to be found, not necessarily directly for the bee. So I'm kind of giving you this example of sort of what are some of the, the issues that we go through trying to figure out the range and the range contractions of species to determine if they are eligible to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. So, you know, questions that collections can help answer, is this, is this an accurate representation of its range? You know, do we have more information out there? Are we able to connect to collections? Um, you know, in some cases, unfortunately, sometimes people just have this information, you know, buried in their, their folders on their computer. So that's another way that we can connect with those people to get that information out there as well. Um, so another example is, is once a species is listed. So the rusty patch bumblebees, the, our famous bumblebee that is uh, protected under the Endangered Species Act here. And it used to be a very common general, and it's a generalist bumblebee. And if you look at the map on the right, that grayed out area is where its um, historic range was. Again, that's something that we know from collections. 
Um, currently, Fish and Wildlife Service, because it is listed, it, it needs to protect the bee. And you can see those sort of, you can kind of see the red areas, but you can see the yellow areas. There's red area dots in the middle of those yellow areas. And those are the um, locations that the bee was known since 2007. So again, also important for collections. And those are the areas that the Fish and Wildlife Service is focusing on for its protection. Um, but we can continue to use collections to determine where the bee was, where it is, and then its habitat, and then it's the potential best areas for its mitigation and recovery. So it's extremely important as well. Um, and then finally, an example of um, some policy that collections can intersect with that I've worked on. So the Saving America's Pollinators Act um, has been introduced actually almost every year for a while, but uh, this past year, 2019 and 2020, was um, the strongest it ever was. Basically, the idea behind SAPA, as we call it, um, was to uh, ban neonicotinoids. And so this is an action that the EU has already undertaken and that we would really like to see happen here in the United States for pollinator protection in particular. So not only does it do that, but it also understands that we have, you know, a dearth of information about native bees. And so it includes uh, monitoring of native bees in the policy. Um, and so it requires monitoring in, in areas all along um, the United States. And it also requires kind of to interact with professionals, collections professionals included, to figure out the best way to catalog the biodiversity of native bees in the country. And then of course, house the collections. And then finally, I'd just like to show this, uh, these two figures actually from a paper that I was involved in that was published um, in January of this year called uh, um, International Scientists Formulate a Roadmap for Insect Conservation. And um, I was looking through the figure again and realizing that in fact, they're pretty much, you, if, you, you could, if you really stretch, you could figure out how collections could uh, intersect with all of these initiatives that are needed to conserve insects, but some that are, are clear that uh, absolutely need collections and museums include things like education for awareness, citizen science, capacity building, conservation of threatened species, as I just laid out. Also, um, prioritizing performing large-scale assessments on the conservation status of insect species. So the status of these species are something we really need to know. It includes IUCN red assessments, red list. Um, and then some midterm and long-term actions, um, analyzing current data on insect diversity that is present, um, such as in museum collections. It's something we need to do, you know, for insect conservation. Before we can move on, we sort of need to know what we already know and what we don't know. Um, and then a global monitoring program, which clearly, like the native bee monitoring, is, is dependent on collections. So I'll end there, but those are some of the ways that my work intersects with collections um, and how I would like to see um, the, collect the, the relationship between collections and conservation uh, move forward. All right. Super. Thanks so much, Tara. I need to. I'm having trouble getting the Zoom back to where it was, so I don't know if Andy can stop sharing my screen or not. <laughs> Or maybe someone else. I don't know why this is. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Got it. And um, <laughs> next up, we have Rob Grubb. Hi. Thanks, everybody. Um, glad to to be joining you today. Um, so yeah, Robert Grubb, and I'm with American Institute of Biological Sciences and the Natural Science Collections Alliance. And since Tara started with the banana slug stuff, I will say that I actually started out, um, did my undergrad at, at UC Santa Cruz, um, and then uh, progressed into um, sort of more ecological and, and grassland related work in grad school at Oklahoma, but still managed during grad school to do a couple of conservation projects involving um, insects. So looking at populations of American bearing beetle a couple of decades ago, I guess. Um, anyhow, after that, I transitioned into, I guess, the world of science policy, where I've, um, public policy in general, really, where I've kind of been hanging out for the last um, couple decades, and really working, whether it's from federal agencies or from Congress or nonprofits, wh wherever the sector, in, in terms of how do we promote 
science-based decision making? How do we um, try to infuse data into to our processes and policies? Um, and so I've worked on that from a number of different perspectives. And um, so I think what I would like to try to do today is just toss out a few things that I think are, are opportunities for this community to sort of strengthen its message and, and move the needle forward. Um, but there are also a couple of, of areas where I think biology sort of at large has often had a hard time sort of um, rallying around its own message. And so, um, again, from my perspective, um, you know, working with AIBS and, and the Natural Science Collections Alliance, which are two organizations that try it and, and you know, unify natural history collections, leadership, or um, in the case of AIBS, the scientific community around common challenges and really what, what can we do to sort of promote increased investment, increased utilization of, of research, science-based um, decision-making, um, you know, quality information and all, all those sorts of things. Um, what we've really always been working toward is how do we pull the community together so that it can speak with, with a more unified voice in a concerted and coordinated direction such that we can you know, uh, have greater impact, frankly. And so um, I think there's a history and a tradition um, within a lot of science fields to sort of um, focus on what makes them unique and not to necessarily look up a level and see where there's common challenges and opportunities for coordination. And I think that for biology these days, um, obviously biodiversity conservation is one opportunity for unified action, but also biodiversity research um, and, and its application and it, the benefits that can be derived from that are increasingly obvious and relevant and significant. Um, and can be catalyzed even more with new investments and new tools and techniques and, and support for natural history um, institutions, um, which is great because that's a huge opportunity for the community to um, hopefully go pursue new investments and secure new investments that will bolster the infrastructure that uh, both human and physical that we all have, uh, but that will also provide the mechanism to sort of um, build new bridges between uh, biodiversity scientists and policymakers, economists, the public, other research fields. And so, um, again, you know, I think there's, you know, we look in, in biology, there's been a long history of, you know, we have ichthyology here and we have ornithology and we have, you know, we, we break into our sort of taxonomic groups um, for, for the science, but, you know, then we lose some of those, those shared conversations and opportunities to, to unify and work together. And so that's where I think there's a huge need and opportunity. And I think that the community and, and what spinach is doing is, is excellent. How can that now, you know, sort of link and, and partner up with what other societies are doing? And can we get all of them kind of working together to, to tackle some of these, these issues? So AIBS, for, for example, about a year ago, organized a, a meeting of its member leaders um, to sort of look at, you know, what's the next step? You know, we called it uh, beyond specimens. So how do we, you know, now that we have, if we think about specimens as sort of the center and we, we pull in new tools and techniques, what kinds of research and things can be done and, and what are the benefits to society, whether it's in public health or agricultural and food security, um, conservation or just general, um, advancement of our knowledge. So all of those, those sort of um, opportunities. And I think that, you know, Andy mentioned um, BCON and others have as well, and, I, and the National Academy Report. And I, I think that that's, those are two um, excellent and timely um, reports, um, opportunities that are now out there. So BCON um, issued the Extended Specimen Network report. The National Academies has its, its recent report out. Um, you know, we have work coming out of Europe on where they're, they're pursuing DISCO and, and things like that. So we have a global network forming of, of sort of coalescence around how do, we, how do we link specimens to other data? How do we link it across borders? How do we link it? You know, all these sorts of, of new things that create new opportunities to solve real world problems. And I think that 
obviously biodiversity conservation is a real world problem that needs to be solved and, and we need to be a little bit more strategic and impactful with it. Um, I think that's a compelling framework. These, these different research tools and paradigms that are, are evolving are wonderful opportunities to pull in additional parts of the scientific community to talk with um, us to be part of this sort of um, conversation, but ultimately the advocacy. Um, more voices all kind of articulating um, what we need. Um, you know, not long ago I had a, a colleague say, well, you know, I'm a biologist and I had to tell my, my dean that one of our biggest threats is the fact that biodiversity is, you know, we're losing species. So it's kind of hard to study biology if you're losing biology, right? So, you know, that finding those kinds of ways and, and even better ways to be compelling and to engage the public and policymakers is the other element of what I think is really critical and needed. Um, this community, in addition to, to talking with other biologists, needs to also build and establish strong partnerships with um, you know, psychology, economics, law, communications, all, all these other fields that can help engage new users and help communicate and tell stories to the public or to decision makers who can help quantify the value and the importance of natural history collections, biodiversity, all those things. So we often fall into the trap of, of assuming that everyone else shares our appreciation of these resources and their importance. And that's not, it's not a safe assumption to make. And so we have to find new ways to communicate um, the value and to engage other, other folks in recognizing the value of it. And importantly, to recognize that the data that this community can generate is in fact very significant and important to tackling the problems that are confronting society now. And whether that's identifying future zoonotic diseases or pests for agricultural purposes, whatever it is, um, that's, that's the big opportunity that this community can, can help address um, with, if there's in fact um, some predictable and, and consistent investments and if there's an appropriate mechanism to share this data in appropriate and usable and actionable ways with the people who need to make decisions. So um, with that, I will um, pass the, the virtual microphone on to the next speaker. Look forward to any kind of questions, um, but, but I want to again thank Spinach for convening this. I think this is a, an important and timely topic that, that it's great to see people uh, getting involved in so thanks so much Rob yeah so our our mic gets passed to Jeremy Kerr next thank you it's really um, really nice to have a chance to be here and to join so many colleagues from around the world today uh, I'm gonna just quickly introduce myself while my colleague Andy shares this presentation thank you very much so as Libby mentioned um, I'm Jeremy Kerr. I'm from the University of Ottawa in Canada. I am uh, an ecologist and global change and conservation researcher. And like so many of my colleagues on the panel and in the organizing group, I have in various intensive ways delved into the world of policy, um, particularly around global change and its implications, climate change in particular, but also around the use of evidence in decision making uh, across Canada and to some extent internationally. So I've been very strongly engaged with those things. But what I'm going to talk about today is actually much more directly related to the kind of themes that are really vital for spinach, which is a, a truly excellent acronym. I just like to compliment the society on having chosen something so extraordinary as an acronym. So today's I'm just going to quickly summarize um, a few key themes here and the title of my presentation will be Windows to the Past and Bridges to the Future. Next slide, please, Andy. So what I wanted to point out are some specific ways in which biodiversity collections, the sort of essential tools that natural history collections around the world make available to the public and to researchers, these are the tools that essentially tell us how we can save our future. They let us know what changes are happening and they let us know or they give us the capacity to know why those changes are happening. So in that respect, they are windows on the past 
And without that window on the past, there is no particularly clear bridge to either a broader community represented by the public or indeed to the future where we would like to see conservation become much more effective uh, and broadly uh, adopted by the general public and indeed policymakers. So what I would argue is that natural history collections also give us the capacity to ensure solutions for conservation are more inclusive. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. Next slide, please, Andy. I think we all realize that the rate of environmental change that we are now confronted with is extraordinary and indeed in most important respects, unprecedented. And this is now recognized through the, the general belief, although I don't think it's official yet, that the Anthropocene has begun. This is denoted by the rap rapid acceleration of human domination of global biogeochemical processes. And one of the emergent consequences of that global um, change in who controls, what controls biogeochemical processes is that we are looking at the sixth mass extinction. Uh, and so extinction rates for basically every single group for which any sort of monitoring information exists, those extinction rates have all gone exponential. And we are, as a consequence, looking at very substantial losses of species in the coming century and exactly what those losses will be remains a point of scientific contention. But for purposes of my presentation today, that number is, is not important in particular, except that the number is very, very large. So that's something we should be concerned with. Next slide, please, Andy. Museum collections give us the baseline. If we don't know where we are coming from, it is extremely difficult to see what the trajectory of change will be for the future. So as a window to the past, museum collections essentially tell us what we started with. We all understand that the nature of those observations are that there is a lot of, there are a lot of gaps from place to place. There are a lot of gaps through different time periods because collections are not constant and they are not universal but we have sufficient information to know where to begin to draw the trend lines for change. In the absence of the capacity to draw those trend lines for change, we are not in a good position to make an evidence-based argument to policymakers and indeed the broader public that we have a problem. So what natural history collections have done for us, and this is a priceless global contribution, is enable us to put the very first point on the graph telling us what changes are underway. And this is without ascribing cause to those changes necessarily at all. Just simply knowing that change is accelerating is something that has become extremely important for us to communicate. Next slide. So we know that there are many different causes for the kinds of global accelerations and extinction rates and species decline, population level declines that we see. My colleagues, uh, Dr. Cornelisi, for example, mentioned the use of neonicotinoid pesticides as contributing to bee declines, and there is no question that such effects can be very significant. I'll mention, I'll, I'll focus a little bit on an application of my own work toward looking at how climate change has contributed to biodiversity decline. And in doing so, I would like simply to emphasize that although I believe climate change, the evidence around its impacts right now are, is, is very strong, it in no way precludes that there is more than one thing going on. So habitat loss, land use conversions, land use intensification, the widespread use of pesticides in ways that are substantially not improving anything agriculturally, these are all contributing factors to biodiversity decline. But in terms of this first theme that I wanted to mention, this windows to the past theme, that I think is, is just indispensably and irreplaceably served through natural history collections, some of the basic things that those collections tell us, and in, in a, as a science user of those kinds of observations, these are the things that you cannot do without. They tell us species locations through time and space. 
they give us the capacity to make inferences about the role of environmental change in changing those distributions in time and space. And then they give us the capacity to do that last step in the chain, which is simply test whether or not those trends are related. Does environmental change of one sort or another predict what has happened with biological diversity through time? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the applications of this kind of approach to bumblebee conservation, particularly the susceptibility of bumblebee species to aspects of global change, particularly climate change. Um, but the kinds of observations and the density of observations that we have for bumblebees, as well as for a small number of other groups, is now so high that we are actually at the point where we can begin to ascribe particular causes and make predictions about the trajectory of change. Next slide. So we know that there are a few particular trends with respect to how climate change is beginning to affect where bumblebee species are found across Europe and North America. And I'll just note here for the record that these are the two continents for which reasonable bee data are available over long time periods and have also been mobilized for science application. And I think we should be cognizant of the fact that when we think about Europe and North America, this is a this is our habitual focus. It's determined by data availability predominantly, but we have to be careful not to exclude the, the other continents on planet Earth uh, and recognize that these environmental changes are also occurring in distinct ways in those places and that they interact with human activities and human cultures in those places and that needs to be part of our thinking. But with respect to what we know in places like North America and Europe, we are seeing evidence of widespread geographical range shifts with respect to bumblebees, but they are not of the sort that we see with other groups, butterflies, for example. So with respect to bumblebees, what's happening is that their ranges are rolling up like a rug from the south. And this is occurring as a consequence, we think, or at least it's occurring as a in sync with uh, rapid warming in those areas. And so bumblebee species are disappearing from the hottest places that they have historically occupied. We need to be aware that the implications that we are losing or seeing declines in pollinator communities across broad geographical areas touches on the kinds of ecosystem services that we have historically taken for granted. Next slide, please. So I'm hoping that this animation is going to work. Okay, so thinking about this correlation between changing climatic conditions and the loss of bee species across broad geographical areas invites the question, why is climate change doing this? And I think we also have to account for the fact that environmental change is, you know, and when we measure it as climate change, is actually not experienced by most species. I mean, most species never experience climate change. What they experience is weather differences. They don't live long enough to experience climate. They live for a year or less. And this means that the mechanism, the pathway for the impacts of climate change necessarily comes through the likelihood and extremity of extreme weather conditions. So extreme weather is growing both more frequent and more intense. If you measure the frequency and intensity of climate change with respect to the tolerances that species have, and you put that together and make predictions across broad geographical areas, what you find is that this actually explains a meaningful amount of the trends that we see with respect to bumblebee species declines across both Europe and North America. The reason that this kind of work is possible to do is that natural history collections have provided us with this window on the past. They are telling us where species used to be found. They are telling us that species have moved into new areas, have declined in areas that they historically occupied. So that window to the past is the reason that mechanistic links with Environment, between environmental change and biodiversity change can actually be tested at all. 
And that is the foundation for providing evidence-based perspectives to policymakers. So as happy as we all are about being able to do really interesting and fun science, we have to recognize that the building blocks for that science is actually coming out of these natural history collections that are being marshaled and made uh, mobilized for, for broad use. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned in a few different ways, the ways in which I think that natural history collections are windows on our past, where we are coming from with respect to biodiversity change. But I also think that they are bridges to the future. And there are some specific ways in which this is true. First of all, you can't have a bridge if you don't have a starting point. The natural history collections give us the place to anchor the bridge. So what we need to do is think about how we are going to reach forward and reach out to build a broader community that is engaged and that is inclusive. One of the ways in which this sort of thing is possible is to engage with and recognize the contributions to biodiversity knowledge from citizen science that I think we should now be calling something slightly different, either community science or community engaged science. And if we examine the relative roles of citizen science in contrast or in comparison with the kinds of data that were collected and curated professionally through natural history collections, what we find is that citizen science sometimes contributes things that complement the baseline information that was provided by natural history collections. So we did a study that was published a couple of years ago in Global Change Biology that looked at this. And what it did was it, it basically just measured the relative contributions of both citizen science and natural history collections to overall biodiversity knowledge in a model group of organisms, in this instance, butterflies, and it was across Canada. What you find when you do this kind of analysis and you really careful quantitative kind of work is that you can't get a complete picture for anything if you don't begin with natural history collections. However, citizen science or community engaged science provides specific novelty that was not otherwise going to be possible purely from the historically collected data that's housed within our museums and collections internationally or within indeed my own country of Canada. The reason that this is helpful is to recognize that the real community that natural history collections can engage with is actually everybody. People love collecting things. This is not to say that we're gonna convince everybody to go out and become butterfly and bee and tiger beetle collectors overnight, although they should, because it's really cool. These things nonetheless are, these, these kinds of interests in natural history observations and collections, what we found is that if you provide tools to let people do this, that a large number of people will immediately jump on the opportunity. And this led us to create in Canada, this program eButterfly.org, which has since expanded to the United States and now across um, the Americas to the edge of South America. And it's, it's enabled us to collect a huge amount of data really, really quickly. And we could see that this actually helped our insight with respect to what we thought we already knew um, with respect to the distributions of species through time. Next slide, please. So natural history collections are vital. I don't think we are going to find a way forward for conservation unless we are able to marshal what we already know. So in a sense, you know, this window on the past that natural history collections provide us makes them into a kind of a time machine that lets us go back and see what the world used to look like with respect to where species were found. This is vital for the capacity to provide insight into the future. But that baseline knowledge is also the mechanism that lets us reach out and engage a broader community through citizen or community-based science. There are so many ways in which we can bring those two solitudes together to build a, a bigger and more effective whole that will let us 
establish policies that might make a difference with respect to conservation into the future. Next slide. So I just wanted to say very quickly, thank you to the really superb organizing committee who put this session together. Thank you so much for the chance to talk about one of my favorite things and also to the really amazing panelists that I get to share uh, today's platform with. It's a real pleasure to be here and thank you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Next up, we have Rebecca Johnson. Thanks, Libby. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen, but don't think I have, not sure if I have access. You should have, I made you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay. There we go. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. Well, thanks also for me for this invitation. It's very exciting to be part of this, um, this meeting. I am the Chief Scientist and Associate Director for Science at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Um, I'm here in my office. Um, I've only been here for about seven months and this is about the fifth time since March that I've been in my office. Uh, so I'm quite new to the United States. I was previously at the Australian Museum in Sydney, Australia, where I was chief scientist for the final five years, but I was there for about 16 years in total. Um, my first experience with collections was not long after I started at the Australian Museum. I was the genetics laboratory manager and I, um, I had a call from the New South Wales police who were investigating a crime, what was alleged to be a crime, someone had run over a, um, a, a group of people had seen someone run over a group of cockatoos, which is which are rather large birds, um, very iconic um, parrots that are very common in Australia, if you've ever visited. And, um, and, and this, this car seemed to have intentionally run over the, this flock of cockatoos that were being fed in a local park in, in one of the suburban areas of Sydney. So the police were called, uh, they went to the, uh, the, the address where the vehicle was registered. The person said that they had no involvement in it whatsoever, but on further inspection, the police did um, in fact find blood underneath the vehicle. Um, and that's, that's what you're looking at here in, in this, this photograph. Um, so they called us at the Australian Museum in the genetics lab and said, is there any way that you can help us to identify what this is? Um, this is a sulfur crested cockatoo, in case you're wondering. Uh, they're, they're large birds, and so um, unfortunately in this event, uh, 25 animals were, were either killed instantly or euthanized because they were badly injured. Um, I figured, I've never done this kind of thing before, but we have a, a fabulous bird collection at the Australian Museum, so I would readily have um, reference material to compare the unknown genetic sample to. Um, and in fact, it was shown to be a sulfur crested cockatoo, the blood that was taken from under this vehicle. Um, the person that owned the vehicle originally said that they weren't involved. Um, charges eventually were laid. Um, by the time it got to court, um, he did in fact plead guilty. Um, and he didn't already have a license because he had already been convicted of manslaughter. Um, so while that's a that's a rather sobering story um, for me as an early early museum researcher at, at in genetics, I thought, wow, what an amazing use of natural history collections, things that you had never thought of. Um, fast forward. 16 or so years from then. Um, now I'm chief scientist of the, the largest natural history collection in the world. Uh, our collection uh, numbers are just over four, 146 million uh, objects. Um, and you can see here um, one of the most, some of the most iconic photos of natural history museums in the world are these photos by Chip Clark. Um, and I particularly chose this because it features Roxy Laybourne in the foreground there um, and, and other members of the bird uh, collection group. And Roxy, of course, pioneered bird strike analysis um, if, starting from the 1960s. So using um, museum collections, particularly the feathers from, from the bird collections to identify snage and, and um, remnants of items that were left behind after a bird strike. 
So the the I was very inspired by this um, at, in, at the Australian Museum. So so it's rather special for me to be now now part of that collection and overseeing the, the work that is done. That is a very large a very large aspect of what we do and, and a very very impressive use of our collection. Um, it, also in my my um, science part of my life, when I'm not doing science leadership, um, I was the leader of the Koala Genome Consortium. And uh, this was a project that was that I led at the Australian Museum with, with many collaborators, of course, like like many genome projects. And uh, while, of course, this was a great foundational science project where we learned a lot about um, koalas through the de novo sequencing of their genome, one of the one of the underlying drivers was con conservation of this incredibly iconic species, which is increasingly endangered in Australia. And, and while the, it resulted in um, lots of scientific outputs, um, one of the proudest outputs that we had was where genetic data was actually uh, used or and, and, and included in a strategy that was put out by the New South Wales government as one of the key mechanisms for monitoring and understanding koala populations over time. Uh, so this was this was a great opportunity to to show the synergy between science and policy and also to to take it that extra dimension the australian museum has koalas that were collected uh, not long after european settlement of australia so going back 150 or so years um, for that particular collection and so that's many koala generations that you can also look at change over time by looking at genetic diversity among other things uh, another really important aspect of collections, of course, is how accessible and discoverable they are. Um, to, to continue on the koala theme, uh, if you're not familiar with koalas, they don't usually look like this. Um, this poor little one had, was a survivor of one of the bush of one of the survivors of the bushfires over the last Australian summer, 2019 through 2020. Um, and and as, as part of a number of expert panels um, advising on koalas, I was with colleagues was asked to to understand exactly what the impact was to koalas and other other um, other species as part of the biodiversity of Australia. This is a map, um, and this is in the early days of the fires. The hashed area of this map of Australia are the areas that are, were thought to have been burned. It's probably more se serious or more, more impacted than that, but you can see it's a, a large chunk of the country. It's also a large chunk of the country where, where um, large numbers of the population live. Um, so koalas were not only the, the icon of, of the damage that the fires had caused to biodiversity, but they were also somewhat of a representative of, of the, the damage that they had caused uh, to, to life and property and other things. So to assess the, the impact of these fires on biodiversity, by the time I, I had left Australia earlier this year to join the Natural History Museum, the, um, a lot of these areas were still unsafe where there were fires that they were either still burning or there was a lot of unsafe um, trees that were falling. And so it was very, very difficult to get an impact of how significant those fires were for many reasons, but, but what we're all here to talk about is biodiversity and conservation. Um, so, so I'm a huge advocate for aggregators and, and making collections data accessible and discoverable so it can be used in, in aggregators like the Atlas of Living Australia, which is the one that we have in Australia. So using the data that was available in, in um, aggregators like this, we were able to at least look at preliminary species lists and, and have a preliminary understanding of, of the impact that these fires might have had on biodiversity. The, the kind of desktop survey that is really only possible if you can't get into those spaces. Um, and of course, there's there's so much more to add to those, that, but they're, they're, the ones that are, are, um, are fa fairly actively contributed to are incredibly valuable. So moving on to, to some really um, important research that has been facilitated at Natural History through digitisation of our collections, I just wanted to highlight the work of Dr Anna Phillips, who is our curator of parasitic worms. And, you know, and, and really, she, so she, she's interested in all sorts of parasites, uh, particularly those um, from invertebrate zoology. And she was able to, this is, this is um, a line from, from one of her recent publications. So using the most comprehensive spatially explicit data set available for parasites, they projected range shifts in a changing climate and they estimated the extinction rates for eight major parasitic clades. 
Um, this was using about one third of our parasite collection that, that was able to be digitized. Um, of, our, of, our, of our extremely large collection, only a fraction of it is currently digitized and, and accessible in this way. But you can see the, the kind of impact that Anna's work and having the kind of expertise that Anna is able to bring to these spatially and temporary, temporally rich data. She and her colleagues estimated that five to 10% of parasite species could be extinct in the next 30 or so or 40 years, which, which is um, quite, quite um, in, incredibly impactful, very scary, and also gives us a real imperative to the value of, of digitising our collections and, 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 and how we might turn our attention to that, either as individual museums, but ideally as a community. Um, so I'm a huge believer that collections are one of the, the most valuable scientific infrastructure that we have, um, it, either individually, um, of course, this is a slightly glib way of describing the value of our collections. There, there's more than one use for every object in our collection, um, and, and every single one of them helps to our understanding and our improvement of our, of our understanding of, of our world. I'd like to also thank the organisers for um, the invitation to be here. I'll leave you with some of these extraordinary photos of Chip Clark and, and uh, like my fellow panellists, I'm, I look forward to the discussions that we're going to have. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And um, last but not least for this intro round will be Henry McGee. Hi, right, so just to, <clears throat> to share my screen, hopefully. Uh, can you see, see it okay? Yes, looks great. Right, so I'll do the, um, okay. <clears throat> so, so I'm uh, Henry McGee, I'm, uh, I work now as a, a museum consultant based in the UK and um, I would say that I've been working with natural history collections for about 36 years, although I'm about, four, well, 48, because I, I mean, I was, it's, to me, collections make up, they make perfect sense. I was totally obsessed with nature growing up. I collected lots of things boiling bodies up, all that kind of thing. Um, and then my, the collection I've put together is in a museum now, because I built up quite a good one, so I lived in the countryside. Um, and then my kind of whole career has been about uh, nature and the environment in different ways. Um, and I've worked in museums for, for a long time at Manchester in the, in the UK mostly. And I think one of the, the points I'd kind of, that I have to remind myself of again and again is that, that for many people, museums, they just don't make instant sense. And so that's why I included this line here that for me, I got into museums, not because I was interested in conserving natural history collections. I got into them because I was interested in nature. And I would say that for many people that, that the same applies. <clears throat> I think it's, this is a bit of a presumption that most people come to museums not because they're interested in looking at old faded dead things in cases, they come because they can see the connection between what's in a museum and nature. They wanna do something about it, they're interested. Yeah, and so that's my first bit would be, if I had a, a magic wand to, to shake would be that spinach and your committee is, you know, be, becomes um, kind of, can, can articulate that, that, that the value of natural history collections is, is in, in the impact that they can, they can make on conserving nature. And then, as I say, my whole career really has been about looking at, well, how can we just try to get this thing to work better? I mean, I've got a background in, in ecology and science and got a bit fed up with that because, you know, the, in, my, in my naive youth, I used to think, I'll become a scientist, I'll go and do these things and, people will just apply them and it's just not how the world works. I got, it became very frustrating to be honest. Then I thought I'll get into museums and work with education because surely education as well, that, that'll, that'll work. And I realised it's got a part to play but again it doesn't solve everything. And then I thought well no maybe policy that's what we need. And then eventually as I've got older I've realised what we need is we need all of these things. So we need um, collections and we need people as individuals for sure and communities and we need expertise and I think one of the, the reasons I really like uh, museums is because at a time when people are desperate to break out of silos 
museums are quite hard to put into one. They kind of straddle different, different things, a bit of education in you know, schools, lifelong learning, universities, working with policy makers, science, all, all of these things exist a bit, you know, more or less in museums. So there are kind of very comfortable meeting grounds that can help some of these discussions to take place. And then kind, kind of as I've got older, I've been thinking, well, you know, what, what difference would it make to the world if a museum didn't exist? It's a, quite an uncomfortable question to ask museums, but what, why, why do we have these buildings full of millions of things, often with, you know, more or less, you know, sad pasts? Um, and then I've kind of increasingly realised that, well, so I came across this, this relatively recently, that sci the, the, um, everyone has a right to benefit from science. Who knew? It's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. I only found it out last year. Uh, so everyone has the right to take part in cultural life, as I say, to benefit from scientific achievement. And then again, the Aarhus Convention, 1998, everyone has the right to environmental information. They have the right to participate in decision-making relating to the environment. And they can, they can call us to account if that, if that isn't supported. And so what I've kind of realized is that a lot of these um, agreements, these rights, they already exist, but there's a really weak or non-existent connection between these rights and people on, you know, on, on the street. And museums are, I would hope everyone would agree, museums are really implicated in these things. So they have a kind of responsibility to live up to them, but it's also a role to play in society. And I'll keep going with this, this vein. So there are, are already exist a number of uh, declarations on, you know, museums, they want to do this stuff. So there was the Science Centre World Summit in Tokyo in 2017. They adopted this um, Tokyo Protocol on, on the role of uh, science centres it was in supporting the Sustainable Development Goals. And then in 2018, the United Nations and all the world's governments, they included museums in the work programme for the Paris Agreement. Fantastic achievement. Um, uh, last year, we had uh, ICOM as the International Council of Museums, the membership, which is huge, adopted this resolution on sustainability and transforming our world. world. So museums, they want to do this stuff. And all of these examples I've mentioned, they say, oh, well, you know, the, the sustainable development goals, they're the, the blue, they're the they are the best blueprint to use. And I'll, I'll come to talk about them. And then um, the week before last, we had one, the, the Bremerhaven Declaration on Museums and the Climate Crisis was adopted at a, a conference we had in Bremerhaven in Germany, which was a novelty because it was the, the most travel that I've done this year. And because, I mean, I'm not mentioning these ones because I've been involved in, I've been involved in a few of them. And the point to, to make there is that what I'm trying to do is to get these, if we think of these as like the cogs in a machine, that the more you can get the cogs to, in, to, to intermesh in museums, in Paris Agreement and so on, the more the machine is likely, likely to, to actually work. Um, and then in um, uh, 2018, 2019, um, I, I had a project uh, with some funding from the British Ecological Society um, and I put this together because one of the, what I would say is the weaknesses of museums claims of their value is that they're often made by museums. So really the, the case is much more strongly made if it's, uh, if it's somebody else telling you, you know, this museums are really valuable to us because of X, Y, and Z. And so I put this um, project together um, using an article, it's called the, the 100 Questions of Importance for, for the Conservation of Global Biodiversity by, by Bill Sutherland and some others. Um, and it was done through a big um, iterative um, consultation, asking biodiversity workers, researchers, um, what are the 100 questions that if we could answer these would make the, big, the biggest difference for biodiversity? And so what I did was I ran a survey for I ran two surveys actually, one of them for um, nodes of the Convention for Biodiversity, policy workers, researchers, 
conservation managers and so on, on the one hand. And on the other hand, I asked uh, uh, UK museum people and said, well, which of these 100 questions do you think museums could answer? And it was to try to see if there's an agreement or not. Um, and so, and really the reason I did this is because I think it's, in museums, it's slightly dangerous to assume that, that collections can answer all questions because they just can't, of the, the, the can't. And in a way, it's the, it's the other way around, that the disciplines and the questions that get asked are a response to the collections that are available. So if we look back to the, whenever it was, the 1960s and 70s when, when people were assessing eggshell thinning in birds of prey, the reason that they could, put, I would argue, even formulate that question is because they knew these collections existed in museums. If they didn't exist, you know, it's debatable whether the whole field would have got going. And anyway, so you can, there's a, there's a publication that goes with this. You can get it for, for free from the, from the bit.ly link there. I've not, not got time to talk about it just now. Um, but it's just to say that we, I would argue that we need to look for strategic approaches that help broker relationships between museums and researchers and end users. Um, and that also look at some strategic approaches to collections because we can't do everything. You, you can't, um, can't collect everything, of course. And then this is, this is um, an agenda that I totally encourage everyone to become familiar with. Um, are the sustainable development goals which were agreed in 2015 to run till 2030 um, and most people I would guess are probably familiar with the nice 17 goals um, really the thing to say is that they don't make sense unless you read the vision that's in transforming our world which is absolutely excellent and the reason that I mentioned this as being so good is that um, as I mentioned things like the Convention of Biodiversity 1992 the, um, the Rio Convention, uh, sorry, not the Rio, the UNFCCC, UN uh, Framework Convention for Climate Change, all of these things, they all mention the importance of public engagement and participation. And we're 30 odd years down the line, and it's taken till now to recognize that in a way. So the, the reason that the goals are so great is because they already incorporate all of these different um, big picture um, uh, agreements. And they're also really helpful because they help to make sure that in addressing one problem, you're not just creating a problem for someone else. You have to address these things all together. And there, there are some very obvious links between these and natural history collections, uh, not just in terms of goals 13, 14 and 15, but in terms of all of them. And so I, I put this, this together last year. So it's a kind of, uh, easy introduction to the sustainable development goals for museums uh, and again you can get that for, for free from the, the bit.ly link uh, and as a measure of how much interest there is in this so this has maybe been downloaded maybe 11 and a half thousand times pretty much everywhere so this is this is why they are so great is because they apply everywhere to all sectors they are a kind of ready-made common language that we can all we can all all share they're, they're, they're brilliant. And then my last um, uh, shameless plug is for, um, I'm involved in a project called uh, Reimagining Museums for Climate Action, um, which a team of us are working on and it leads to a, a exhibition that, that will be in Glasgow ahead of the, the COP, the climate change uh, conference next year and, and at the same time. And we're super interested in hearing from anyone who's, who's just interested in the idea. So. So please get in touch. And that's, that's my last slide. Thanks, Henry. And thanks to all the panelists for those really in-depth introductions. I think that gives us a great point from which now to uh, follow up with some discussion points. And some folks have provided questions ahead of time through the link that was provided um, with the Eventbrite invitation. And then we've had some great questions in the Q&A box there as well. So how we'll work the rest of the time here is um, we'll start with some of those pre-provided um, pre questions and then jump into anything that's left in the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box. And I invite the panelists, I see Jeremy's already jumped in there, to respond directly to folks um, if things seem most relevant to your area. So 
let's jump in now. This question is uh, kind of in two parts. I tried to merge a couple of different questions and it goes like this. What innovative, unexplored, or new opportunities do you see for engaging natural history collections to mobilize their specimen level data for conservation? And then the, the second part is getting into the specifics of it when we talk about regions of the planet with the most biodiversity, potentially those regions are also those with fewer resources, and thinking about populations that are underrepresented, underserved, small collections, folks that generally are, are not currently at the table. And um, I know this topic could fill days of discussion, so perhaps we could focus on a few succinct points and I'm going to apologize in advance for um, jumping in a little bit to keep us on a, a set time here. And um, not to put you on the spot, Rebecca, but if you had any um, first thoughts on this, um, I know that you'll, you'll need to jump off before too long. Um, if you wanted to get to kick us off with this. Um, sure. Uh, if, I, if it's okay, um, I might jump to the second half of that question, of course, yeah. which is um, ensuring that everyone feels engaged and included in, in valuing biodiversity and contributing to valuing biodiversity. Um, and, and we see repeatedly that most of the, even, even the collections from the most megadiverse countries tend to end up in the big museums, predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere. I would say um, we need to ensure that the that people from the home countries of those collections need to be at the table and we need to be, this is a um, probably a, a very different way of thinking, but um, collections are probably um, often criticised for being quite colonial and now is the time that we need to change that. We, we need to make sure that the, the people, people who probably have a lot of knowledge about those collections and a lot of knowledge about those species, uh, either through traditional knowledge or, or just you know, it, it being one of their endemic, one of their, or many endemics, they need to be part of that conversation. Um, we think about this a lot at Natural History. Um, it's obviously a very big conversation in Australia as well. And um, it does require going a little bit more slowly. Um, there's there's a, another conference going on this week, which is um, the Biodiversity Genomics Conference. Um, and there's a lot of discussion there about how, what does it mean when we open genomic data? And, and, and um, it's, it is appropriate to ask for permissions and, and to ideally start collaborations right from the beginning or second best scenario involve the the home country people people from the home country of those organisms in the collaboration that uses those data. Thank you. Uh, would other panelists like to chime in as well? Can I say something. Yeah, please. I think, I mean, this this discussion about the um, the balance of. Um, resources is often in the big museums in the global north but whereas the impacts are felt in the global south and in, in often in the global south and i think personally that that puts a big responsibility on making at least the information from those collections available to the people in those countries who can make let's face it most use of it so i think in a way, it, 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 there can be a slightly um, oversimplified version, which is like, well, we'll give all these, we'll return these collections to these countries. There's not enough time to address these challenges. We need to get moving with addressing the challenges now. So at least it's certainly involving communities and understanding, well, what are the problems and the questions that, that they want to answer with these collections rather than the global north assuming that oh well we'll do all this stuff and then because that's just not how things should work it should be based on on the needs i, I think i'll maybe just uh, add a, a brief note to henry's really excellent point and then both rebecca and henry have uh, i think hit the, the critical themes here but we need to be very careful to avoid a savior science where people with a lot of privilege kind of helicopter into communities and explain to people who have been living with the species in their environment for time immemorial, you know, what they really need to be working on. And I think we need to spend a lot more time listening to communities who want to have 
real authority and control over the systems with which they share their environment. You know, not, not to have us explain to them, you know, this is just like a horrible patronizing, disrespectful thing to do to show up and, and tell everybody, you know, let, let me help you understand the environment you live in. This is not to say that, you know, science in general isn't sometimes going to provide surprises that can affect any community anywhere. But I think that these kinds of engagements need to begin with listening, not explaining. And the other part is to ensure that those communities are leading um, the local initiatives, not being tapped on the shoulder so that we can kind of helicopter in take the stuff we were really interested in, helicopter back out, and you know, they're kind of left wondering what just happened. You know, we see this kind of thing over and over and over again. It happens all the time with indigenous communities in Canada. <laughs> this is not the model uh, for, for how to proceed. True engagement requires sustained interaction that's based on respect and listening. That was very succinct indeed. Thank you all. Um, I will jump into the next question here. Um, is activism compatible with professionalism? <laughs> I think Jeremy's very like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Is there head banging or really into this? Yeah. That's essentially my job description. <laughs> <laughs> senior scientists and an activist and majority activist um, nonprofit. Um, so I would like to say yes. <laughs> and I'm glad Jeremy was enthusiastic for saying yes. Um, I think there are various levels of activism that people can play throughout their career. Um, uh, you know, as um, as the, the senior scientist at, at my organization, um, you know, I'm sort of low on the activism totem pole, <laughs> pretty much at the bottom, because my, you know, my um, position is to to look at the evidence, you know, look at the evidence and see what we can say um, for conservation. What species are rare? What species aren't? What do we've got? You know, using museum collections, um, as I said. So um, that's my job, and um, you know, what we do is based on the scientific evidence. Um, you know, definitely, you know, we also have a media and communications team that have goals to get information out there in certain ways. And so sometimes, you know, obviously that's a little bit splashy, um, but definitely it's grounded in the evidence. Um, and so that's what I do. So, so I would say yes. I mean, I'm not sure else how to answer that question, but maybe if, if other panelists, I would actually like to hear from other panelists too, just because I probably am the most um, activist of, of all of us. <laughs> I'll uh, jump in with with a couple comments, I guess. I mean, I, I think um, there's absolutely a role and a need for scientists to engage with policymakers or the public or you know wherever in that continuum. What I encourage people to think carefully about is where they tend to jump into that process and what they want their role to be or how they want to be perceived because there's different um, ways that that can shape or influence your career. I think um, where scientists have sometimes gotten into trouble is, um, you know, there's a need to be cautious about when you start jumping to the policy intervention kind of space, um, I think people really need to know what they're talking about. And it needs to be clear that they're talking about policy issues that they understand fully. Um, there's a lot of times where scientists will, you know, sort of jump in and, and defend a certain policy action, not really understanding its full complexity or appreciating that science is one of the inputs. And so I think that, um, you, know, you know, that can get you in, in a lot of trouble. I think that um, it will, it can tarnish your reputation or, or how you're perceived or who will call on you in the future. So really kind of grounding yourself in what, where you're comfortable being in that process and, and what it is. 
I think that there's absolutely no problem though with scientists and there's an obligation for scientists to share what the science says and to share it in understandable and actionable ways to provide that data. Um, so again, I think that that's, that's absolutely something that we, everybody should be involved in um, and figuring out how to communicate about it in an understandable way. But, you know, sort of leading the march, <laughs> You know, when you get to that level, that's where you really, I think, want to be judicious and thoughtful about, you know, what your role is going to be. And, and again, there's roles for that and there's need for that. And there's need for scientists to be involved in that. But um, when you start to do that, you become a little bit less of a scientist and more of a, of a advocate or champion. And that's, it's not bad. It's just, you know, your, how you're perceived will change. Um, and, and so I think too, with institutions, the kind of how you're engaging and educating and, and what positions you're taking, you know, need to be vetted and thoroughly thought through. Because again, one of the things that, that most in the public still do, um, if you look at, at opinion surveys and things like that, generally speaking, for the majority of, of people, scientists and scientific institutions are still valued um, by the public. You know, there's some erosion here and there, but they look to scientists to provide them with the data and to help explain what's happening. And they, they don't want to feel that that's getting pulled um, by agendas. And you, you, we can see this now, you know, I mean, um, if you watch in the US, for example, um, the COVID response, and you watch how um, let's say Dr. Anthony Fauci has been able to sort of walk a line. And if you, you look at public attitudes, he's viewed as, as being a truth teller, right? And um, so that, that's an important thing to, to keep in mind as, as you sort of approach um, where you're gonna be in that advocacy perspective. Now that all said, and then I'll stop talking. I also think that there's absolutely an obligation for everyone to be an advocate for their science. So ensuring that um, the institutions are receiving the funding and support they need, whether that's by advocating within an institution or a board of regents or whatever that might be, or with policymakers or anything else. This is your profession and you know it's perfectly appropriate to say we need more resources, we need more training, we need more um, these barriers need to be eliminated to do this, what have you. So absolutely an obligation and a need to also advocate for your profession. And that nobody will fault you for being a, a, a champion of or an advocate for. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today and for, your, um, for all of your insights. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you so much. I apologize that I have to jump off a little soon. Um, it, it's, I've learned a lot and I, I look forward to hearing how the conversation unfolds. Thanks. I, I wanted to make sure to um, um, thank Rebecca, but we could also continue this um, discussion um, about activism and then I'll jump into the Q&A. Yeah, Henry. So, so I just wanted to say something about, um, because this, th we had a bit of a discussion about this last week when we were sort of preparing for this. And there is something in this about, um, I think we have to be very clear about what we mean by activism, because these words get, get used and they mean totally different things to different people. And I think there's kind of two points I'd like to make, is, is one of them is, like I mentioned this last, last week, is the importance of, of being clear about the difference um, when we say that museums are neutral, and I think people often mean that, often mean that museums should be impartial, because neutral implies you're doing nothing. That's a total waste of public money, to be honest. Um, but museums are, I, I would hope, impartial, and sci scientists should be um, very well um, versed in this, with the sense that, that science is impartial. Um, and I think the other thing to say with that is that in a time when society is so like split into all kinds of bits, the more that public institutions can work to bring groups together has um, 
is more important than ever because if we're not, if we don't, and we're sometime and we're somehow seen as taking some kind of side, then then that's that's no use. That's that just that just increases the splits. I've got something really quickly. If anybody else has got something, I don't want to intervene or cut anybody off. We need to be very careful um, that we understand that the last hill that science dies on is the one that has to do with the collection and dissemination of evidence. The fact that reality is becoming a partisan issue is not something that we should permit um, to redefine the role of science in society because I think as Henry quite aptly said, if we agree that science should no longer be present in public discussions, then we have consigned ourselves to societal Ill irrelevance. And at some point, the evolutionary outcome of this will be that society doesn't, you know, they get out of the business of public funding of science because we're useless. So I think we need to be awfully careful not to agree to consign ourselves to extinction by virtue of having had, you know, kind of unhinged politicians and mercenary public relations people decide that they really want to keep facts out of the public consciousness. Our job is guardians of the scientific evidence. We can't agree to be anything less than this, but we can do a lot more than that. We have to take Robert's advice that we should be very clear about what we're doing when we do it. If we are speaking purely to the scientific evidence, and you can do this in the context of topics that I deal with routinely here, you know, like climate change or biodiversity and conservation, you can just provide facts and it sounds pretty extreme. So, you know, that's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm conveying information in a strictly factual way and I am wearing my science hat to do so. And I can talk about projections for the future, and they're all rather obvious in terms of what they imply with respect to policy responses. But if what I get into is something much more specific and I start making demands that the policy needs to have exactly this shape, then it is quite likely that I am allowing personal ideology to color my scientific advice. And if I am pretending to be wearing my purely science hat at that time, then I am no longer honestly conveying science. I am, I am being a bit of a chameleon with respect to what I'm doing. So I think we just have to make sure we keep our eyes very carefully on the ball and be very transparent about what we are seeking to, to do at any given moment. And if we choose to take off our science hats, we are citizens too, and we have that right. But we have to be careful not to pretend to be wearing our science hats while actually doing something else. That's where the mistrust would then justifiably be possible. But in terms of the basic issue here, uh, there, there is a line in the sand, so to speak, and that is that we must not agree. That whatever the pressure happens to be, we must not agree to retreat from providing science honestly and broadly understanding that there are circumstances where policymakers need need the evidence discreetly. But in a general sense, science should be broadly available and we are the purveyors of that and natural history collections are the purveyors of that information. That's the bottom line. Yeah, thanks Jeremy for that. Um, I would just like to add that um, you know, being part of that process as the scientists in the room for policy, um, it, it kind of takes a village, I guess, <laughs> to, to take, a, you know, a common saying uh, to do this. And, you know, Jeremy, I think you voice a lot of what a lot of scientists fear is that they are alone and that they have to wear all those hats, you know, like you mentioned. And that's not true, right? So you can come to the table as the scientist, as the evidence-based evidence provider, um, you know, disseminating your work or, or others work that you understand better than, you know, the average person. Um, and then you can work with teams, um, you know, to then craft that into policy that is evidence-based. Um, and so, you know, at the, 
you know, obviously you're not taking off, you know, your hat or, or giving any of the evidence based um, in that instance. However, you might not necessarily be, you know, qualified or, or have the training to then put that information into into policy. And so being able to work with people who have that political science background and able to put that in is, is extremely helpful. And and being the scientist in the room, you know, you've got to keep providing, like you said, keep providing, you know, the evidence, keep providing the information that, that we, we know. Um, unfortunately, I think sometimes when it comes to bridging the divide, there's this issue with uncertainty, right? And as scientists, we are trained not to ever, you know, we, we can't be certain on a lot of things, right? However, when, it, when like the pen hits the paper, sometimes, you know, we need to, that decisions need to be made. And um, you can keep providing that evidence and, and then other people, politicians, you know, take in other factors, social, you know, um, factors as well, economic factors, and then can, can try to advance um, some kind of policy that will touch on climate change or endangered species. Um, and so I think, you know, thinking of it more as a team effort um, and you providing that role, as you mentioned, um, is, is another way to think of it that can be extremely important for scientists to engage in. One last comment on this, if it's good. okay. Um, kind of building on that, one of the things I would encourage everyone to do, and this is, we're seeing more of this now, but this is the kind of time and why this is this sort of infrastructure I'm gonna talk about is necessary is, you know, again, the importance of community organizations, broadly speaking. So your professional societies, the federations, the, the coalitions that can form to tackle these things so that a lot of what we're talking about too, you know, individuals can start to feel very overwhelmed or, or strapped or pulled in many directions. But again, communicating collaboratively together, um, sharing information among your community. So, you know, not expecting a single society to do something, but working collaboratively with others to galvanize the message and the information and to share it and to make it available such that you know another set of coalitions that are maybe a little bit the next step down the the continuum in terms of action can pick it up and and run with it right so um again the, the importance i think you know i i often talk to people and, and they i hear well i don't know why i should belong to a society or an organization or what have you the, these are these are the reasons why you know you have colleagues and, and, and collaborators there with you that you can work with and share the, the um, obligations but the opportunities with. And, and so again, within your communities, but also encouraging your communities to collaborate with others is, is key, I think. Um, we can't do these things one off. I mean, that's, that's how we, we lose the battle. And so I, my parting request is, is let's find ways to work together. Thanks, Rob. That's a great segue into some of the questions, a couple of the questions that have popped up in the Q&A related to funding, because I think um, how do we fund the science that we are describing as well as the collaborations and those connections that need to be made. So um, one of the questions is, is there evidence that major conservation funding bodies are starting to value funding for basic research to provide the foundation for conservation of diverse tropical groups such as insects? This is from Keith Wilmot. Um, if not, are there efforts underway to try to convince such bodies to expand funding priorities from practical conservation of known threatened taxa to building knowledge of other, um, like the vast majority of species which are yet to be assessed or studied? So as, as folks coming from a, um, a community of taxonomists and, and things like this, is there funding for that? And then I think taking that to the next step and seeing some of these other questions, um, how, how do we make all that happen? Is there funding? Uh, I can try to say something. It's a difficult question to answer. Um, but, you know, as, as the example I gave of the Saving America's Pollinators Act, you know, something, and this is something that I was able to, to help. Um, again, I was working with a large team to kind of put that together. And um, something, you know, as, as coming from the insect world and the academic scientists and, and um, knowing the dearth of information we have on insects, particularly for the question. Um, 
I was really pushing to get in that that part about monitoring native bees because you know there's a lot of talk about you know decline of native bees and we need to save native bees you know and of course that's true um, and the neonicotinoids as, as Jeremy and I mentioned are you know it's, it's clear evidence that they're very detrimental um, however part of my instinct as as the scientist in that room was to say well we're there's we just don't know a lot there's so much we don't know about native bees in particular and tropical insects as the person mentioned um and so i think it, it's extremely important to put in those kinds of pieces of legislation the fact that we just we need to know more and monitoring is such a basic part of even beginning to understand and even beginning to apply the policy and so putting that monitoring in in other types pieces of legislation to kind of as, as add-ons that then will you know have funding provided for them um i think that that's really important if you know obviously uh, having that that to be central to a piece of legislation would be extremely important but also just remembering and having the scientists in the room that will say well we can't really go forward with this legislation without actually having more monitoring having more more collections having more organization of the basic data yeah, Henry. Can I say something? Please. For me, part of, the, part of the solution to this is to make more of the collecting that already happens that, that never makes its way into a museum. There's loads of collecting happens, you know, for, for studies, and it, it doesn't get into museums, and that, that seems to be a, a terrible wasted opportunity to me, and that's part of the what I was talking about, the kind of there's just not enough collaboration between universities and, and researchers and I mean how, how many PhD projects must there be every year that are based around a collection that just that just get thrown away and that's so making more effective use of the funding that already exists would seem to me to be to be a crucial step in this. Just a couple of other comments and these are I'll start with sort of a uh, what, what's probably more of a U.S. Um, centric kind of perspective, but I think that part of the challenge that we have in the in the states relative to this is how the funding is allocated, right? So you have private sector foundation funding that's just sort of out there um, that can be hard to kind of find or quantify or, or coordinate. But then when we look at what the government does, it's very piecemeal and it's it's not coordinated as well as i think it could be it's um hard to find and hard to track it shifts depending upon agency priorities and so you know it's sort of like playing a game of whack-a-mole right you're trying to keep track of where it's at and and whether it's getting cut or increased or what have you some of it's very specific to let's say a, a, a agricultural pest whereas other things are are more fundamental, like go understand biodiversity, you know, NSF related funding. So there's, there's a real challenge in terms of figuring out how much we're actually spending, but then too, making sure that what we're spending is in fact coordinated. We're de-siloing things so that there's not, um, you know, a community over here that's funded by NOAA or Department of Commerce and they operate kind of over here doing this and this group is over here by NIH. And what we've not had is, is those kind of communities coming together. And so we, we don't really know sometimes how much is being invested where, or how it's being shared. Again, I think one of the opportunities to, to fix this is, you know, looking at these sort of new kind of calls for collaboration, whether it's extended specimen or it's, it's you know, anything else, that's really talking about how do we pull these things together. And so in the US, you've also got the interagency working group on scientific collections that could be doing more to sort of help coalesce that and, and understand what's happening across the government that then you know needs to partner up with what's happening internationally so that we know and, and leverage what's happening around the world you know how can we maximize the impact um, of the dollars that are being spent on, on research and not be redundant and, you know how do we become more strategic with it so i think there's again this is this is on the community to really make a more vocal push to say these are the kinds of resources we need. We need greater coordination. We need greater transparency as to where they're at and what they're being used for. And, and you know, this is what's missing and where we need more. And, and then to push for it consistently and, and persistently. So um, I think though that the exciting thing is that, is that the science that can be done by understanding and accessing this biodiversity data is now in a way and in a place that it wasn't 
10 years ago. And so you can really kind of galvanize that and, and use it with the benefits to society of understanding these things. I think there's a real opportunity to make a global push, but it, it needs to be done in a coordinated way and, and with great precision and, and persistence. Yeah, and um, looking at the time, we probably have time for one or two more questions um, before wrapping up. So um, scrolling here, I see uh, we have a lot of great colleagues in the audience from Latin America. And so there are some questions about engaging with uh, and building relationships with Latin American institutions uh, with regards to conservation. Um, I wonder if any if any of the panelists can speak to um, specifically that or and I think also broadly, how do we build these bridges with um, with some of our colleagues around the world? Or, or maybe um, uh, examples of maybe how you have done that personally, if, um, if that's applicable. So maybe I'll just have a, a quick go at this one, at least to, in, in, a, in a narrow sense, because I think that the broader issue of, of how we really communicate and value different communities at a global scale is an awfully big topic. And I, that, I'm not gonna have all the answers to that. Such, such a broad but profoundly important question. I think we're, you know, we're all spending a lot of time on Zoom these days. And it's kind of a reminder that we have a capacity to engage with people in really far flung places. And we don't need to all be in the same room all the time for us to have a meaningful, useful, sustained interaction. Just to kind of a note on the, the technical foundations for, for communication here, we're, we're getting a lot better at this. Another aspect of this, I think, however, is that we are able through an enormous array of community or citizen science based initiatives to really engage communities that have historically been excluded from serious discussion about the trajectory of conservation, about the trajectory of use of biological resources. You know, we've done this, you know, ourselves in, our, in small ways with butterflies across, you know, to the, to the edge of South America now. And, you know, that is intended to put decision making into the hands of local communities and insights into the hands of local communities. We aren't creating these tools so that we can take, we're creating these tools so that we can engage and so that we can listen and anybody can contribute to the use of these tools. And when large communities of people actually do this, you know, you start to see a clearer picture about what's going on in particular areas. And this means that we have insight that might not otherwise have been possible. We need to, I think, really recognize and, and value, first of all, the idea that we should be listening more, but also that foundational kind of concepts like citizen science and the use of the tools that are associated with citizen science give voices to communities and give voices to institutions that may have very different funding models than the very you know the, the venerable and powerful institutions that have often been so dominant in our past with respect to natural history collections the smithsonian vitally important but you know it's the goliath institution it's a it's a truly massive player, but it's insights into remote areas, you know, areas that are remote to us may be much smaller than what local institutions in those places have. So we need to be building bridges that make sure that the voices from those communities are heard and valued. I think community science gives us one mechanism to sustain that kind of dialogue. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And I think is a, a good segue also into um, one or two other questions that have popped up around education and educational initiatives. Um, obviously, community and citizen science play a role in education and finding participants great um, uh, informative experiences. Uh, I wonder if anybody else on the panel can speak to 
uh, education in any form as it relates to what we're talking. Yeah, Henry. Um, so, so um, one of the, just to kind of fly the flag again for the sustainable de development goals is one of the great things about them, I, could, I am flying the flag now, is that there are so many resources available around them. So like UNESCO has a whole portal on education for sustainable development that's themed around the goals. And uh, there's one of the, one of the SDG targets is around uh, education for sustainable development. Um, and so I would say that it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic resource and uh, also to say that um, how museums can help play, help um, people access some of the big picture uh, initiatives. So there will be the, obviously the, the post-2020 biodiversity framework. There will be the decade of ocean science starts last uh, next year. The decade of ecosystem restoration again starts next year. And so say when there was, there was a decade for education for sustainable development that finished in 2014 or 15, and almost, no, almost nobody had heard of it. And it's because people hadn't played a part in it. So there's a, there is a big opportunity now with the, particularly the ocean science and the ecosystem restoration. And I think particularly because the decade for ecosystem restoration it, it has a kind of positive sense to it. It's about doing something positive rather, you know, as a, in, the, in the face of so much uh, challenge and doom and gloom. Well, uh, we probably have time for maybe a quick question, unless there are other um, remarks or uh, comments just from the panel that would like that you'd like to state now before we do start to wrap up. Um, I'll, I'll kind of open the floor to that as I scroll for a final question. But um, we, yeah, if there are any, if there are any other, um, yeah, remarks, the the floor is open. And if not, I will pull from these other questions about the, um, let's see, digital repatriation. Um, we've talked, a, a, this is a, a doozy to land with uh, just a couple of minutes left here, but we've, we've talked about the, um, the physical specimens and um, those being often held in institutions far from where they were collected. Um, but what about um, digital repatriation? Well, we could all agree that's really important, I suppose, but uh, Rob, Rob, were you about to jump in there? No, I was, I was just going to say, I, I think, yeah, it is a, a substantial question. I don't have a, a good answer for it. I think it's a lot of conversations. I think there's a meeting of, of some groups talking about aspects of that um, later today. Um, so I think it, it's something that, you know, it's, it's obviously a complicated issue that everybody needs to be um, participating in, understanding, engaging, and finding the best course of action. I, I, I think everybody, um, you know, it's, as we talked about, I think earlier, ensuring that that data is available to the people who, who need it most is, is key. How to do that is, is the challenge. And I, I think, I would hope that, you know, if we start um, thinking about how to deploy new tools um, and, and techniques, that we can probably find some innovative solutions to, to help make that happen. But it's um, definitely a, a big issue that, that warrants um, some thoughtful consideration. Thank you. And I, I know, Jeremy, you have to run. So um, a quick thank you to you, and then I'll, I'll, let, I'll set you free. It's really delightful to have a chance to be part of this event today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, so a huge thank you to all of the panelists that were that were able to join us today to the audience members from around the world. Thank you so much. I know the, the time difference might be great 
from uh, where some of us are. So thank you so much for making the time for this. Uh, and these discussions have provided so much food for thought and some really great ideas for some next steps. Uh, I'm gonna make a last call to put your names and comments and ideas and questions into the Google Doc. You haven't heard the last of this committee yet or haven't heard the last from us. So we will be reading that and following up with those and using those to help guide uh, our next directions. So um, definitely put your information in there. And it's also not lost on me the fact that we are uh, in this Zoom screen here representing the Global North um, much more strongly than the Global South. And so I, moving forward, we would like to more deeply engage with our colleagues uh, in other parts of the world. So um, another invitation to leave your contact information in the doc so that we could follow up with folks who are interested in being a part of the committee or interested in being a part of um, the work that we do through things like webinars and other activities. So. Um, uh, we look forward to continuing to work with all of you. Um, so yes, do keep our eye for future webinars. We will be, um, we hope to continue this, maybe particularly in more directed ways. Uh, this was a great jump off to some of the bigger discussions that are out there. And I think moving forward, we have a great platform now to, to dive into some more details about this work. So thank you again for, for everybody's um, input and effort and being here. And um, we look forward to working together with you in the future. This recording will be available on the Spinach YouTube channel, so you can keep an eye out for that. And um, with that, I will say um, thanks and goodbye. <laughs>